Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the movies. <laughs> Here we go again <laughs> with the movies. These will be free movies with setups and lots of commentary every other Saturday. So today, here we are, the 13th of January, launching our new movie sessions. And today we have a movie that is a classic. Uh, someone was recently on a podcast was saying, what's the movie, what's the movie? I said, well, I'll just tell you a hint. Uh, it's a Steven Spielberg movie. You know you get top, top quality with Steven Spielberg. Some of you might remember that there was a team of Steven Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall. Oh my gosh, those three people together made the most spectacular movies ever. Uh, and today we are going to watch the movie from 1989 called Always with Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter and John Goodman. And what is particularly helpful about today's movie is, today's movie is, you might say, Jesus helping us go at the jugular of, of the ego. In other words, you know, you know if you have dandelions in your yard and you don't want them there, you have to take the dandelions up by the root. You can't just chop off the top with a lawnmower because they'll, they'll grow back. And with the ego, you have to go all the way to the root. You have to go all the way to the jugular to be free of it. And what is the ego's jugular is the, the, its most boasted gifts it's, it's weapons against the light. It's weapons against the mind remembering Christ and remembering God. Well, Jesus, out of his 31 chapters in A Course in Miracles, he spends chapters 15 to 24. That's right, nine chapters on one topic. And there is no other topic that gets nine chapters in a row. So you know that when Jesus is talking about these nine, they're kind of placed in the middle of the text. Like he warms you up, and then he goes, okay, I'm going to pull the blinders off here. And when I pull the blinders off, we're going to look deeply into the core of the ego's belief system. And this is the part that you will be most resistant to. Back around 1990. 1991, I spent a lot of time up at the Foundation for A Course in Miracles with Ken and Gloria Wapnick, and my friend Dorothy, who I talk about a lot, she was up there, and I met her, and she was, uh, she was working, you know, on the, uh, in the garden or working in the kitchen, but she told me that whenever Ken would do workshops on these chapters, uh, special love and special hate relationships, that she said the funniest thing would happen, that, sh that the kitchen team would have to buy seven times as much food for these workshops. People would stuff their faces. You know, you ever had done that when you're nervous and you start the munchies and then you just, you're nervous, you don't feel too good, you munch and munch and munch, and then two hours later, you're munching. Uh, that happened to me one time at a Course in Miracles group where I started to go really deep into the metaphysics and suddenly it got so tense for everybody in the room that they all lunged for the snacks on the coffee table at once. <laughs> it was like, no mas, no more. I'm going to stuff some food in there because it's too, we're getting too deep, it's getting too threatening. And what, what, Basically, what Dorothy was saying was the resistance to what we're look, going to look at today is enormous. So don't be hard on yourself if you go have a hot fudge sundae after the movie today. Uh, just chalk it up to a little resistance and be kind and gentle. And then uh, just be careful you don't go for an apple pie afterwards, you know. <laughs> we don't want to have any... Uh, 
anorexia bulimia issues coming out of today's uh, session because this is deep stuff and that's why every other Saturday I'm just going to show the classics. I'm just going to show our all-time great classics from the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. This is only the primo stuff, absolute primo stuff. It's absolutely free so you can just join in and I'm sure other people will hear about it as it ripples out, but we're going to go very deeply into it. So in today's movie, we have the main character is Pete. He's a firefighter who fights fires from the sky, uh, drops like a cold, like a reddish clay onto fires, uh, fire basically just to put them out. And, and uh, he has a girlfriend uh, who's played by Holly Hunter. Her name is Dorinda. And then we're going to have another character that's going to come in throughout the movie named Ted. So in one sense, you know, you've heard me talk about the threes sometime. You know, in this world, two's company, three's a crowd. Well, the threes get used in a lot of movies because Jesus has to have us look a close look at our ideas of of possession, of jealousy, of exclusiveness, because while those things are very common in special relationships, possession and exclusiveness and jealousy are unknown in heaven. These are all generated by the ego to keep us from knowing agape, eternal, uh, unconditional love of, of heaven and of Christ, which is our true identity. So the entire world is made up of, of fear, false evidence appearing real, of illusions that were made by the ego to take the place of divine love and divine truth. And so what we're dealing with with perception is we're dealing with a, an attempt by the ego to substitute a different reality in place of, of God and heaven. And that's why this projected world is tied so much into fear, guilt, pain, and shame because it's, it's a, an attempt at making a substitute that will take the place of God's love. And, you know, sometimes people have told me an acronym for ego, when I've traveled around the world, people will say, oh yeah, ego, edging God out. <laughs> this is like trying to edge God out completely. I'm talking about complete amnesia, making up a darkness that is so dark, so pitch black, that, that light cannot enter. And that's what the ego's attempt is. The ego's attempt to make an alternate reality, which we now are told, obviously, from Jesus, that this is not reality at all. It's just an attempt at making a substitute for eternal life with God. So, also we have a, a character that's a friend of Pete and Dorinda named Al, played by John Goodman, and we have Hap. Uh, Hap, Audrey Hepburn. Is anybody else a, a beautiful fan of Audrey Hepburn? What a gracious, loving, angelic uh, presence was Audrey Hepburn. You know, she just had a presence. And this is her last movie that she appeared in, and she's appearing in an angel-like character. Isn't that beautiful? Her last movie is, is an, like an angel character. That's a perfect happy dream symbol to, have, uh, to play an angel character if you're an actress. And some of you know that, yeah, there's a lot of those things that happen. You know, Peter Sellers, probably one of the greatest, greatest comedians in the history, his last movie was Being There. It was all about being in the present moment and, and not buying into any of the projections of the world. Or uh, uh, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, you know, guess who's coming to dinner? What a movie, Sidney Poitier. These are like classic, spectacular movies. That was, he was married to Catherine Hepburn and, and uh, I think he died about two months after that movie was made, finished. Uh, you see, even the actors that are all doing this for God, they come here to make their contributions, and then 
before they take a bow and make their exit, they land one great contribution that you'll never forget that will help you release the world and, and remember God. It's, it's very memorable. So Hap, Hap is short for happy. How about that? An angel called Hap for happy. So I thought to start this movie off today, before we get into the movie, I want to really prime your mind, prime our mind for the spiritual awakening. Because this is definitely a relationship movie. We're going to see it acted out. We'll see the special love relationship acted out. The special love relationship is interrupted occasionally by special hate. And, and we've seen that in relationships on earth. Oh, I love you, I love you, you're the greatest, you're the only one, get out. <laughs> you know? You're the one, you're my Valentine forever. Uh, never speak to me again. If you call me again, I'm getting a restraining order. <laughs> you know, it's, it's bizarre. What we have invented, the ego invented a bizarre world with bizarre relationships. And everything about this projected world is an invention. That's, that's a workbook lesson. I've invented the world I see. Even the words are, are totally inventions. In fact, Jesus says that at one, his workbook lesson 184, he says, you know, for a time, you're going to just have to be willing to let the words be spoken through you and used through you to point to the unreality of the world. But then he's going to tell you, actually, I want you to go into the quiet and have quiet spaces where you let go of the words <laughs> completely, all of them. <laughs> because God didn't invent words. Those are an invention of, of the ego to basically guard against true communion. You know, ever have that moment where you're just gazing in someone's eyes and it's, it's wordless silence and you feel all the euphoria of heaven, you don't even need to put the words I love you in there because it's, it's a given. You feel it, you experience, you, you know that intense love. You don't even need, need the words I love you because it's so deep. But actually the Holy Spirit is trying to help us re-engage with, uh, we'll call it true communication, with the Holy Spirit, which is really just let the Holy Spirit speak through you, smile through you, laugh through you, hug through you. Let the Holy Spirit use what the ego made, the body, the words, everything, the images, for the purpose of releasing your mind from the images entirely and seeing them anew with the Holy Spirit's uh, forgiveness interpretation. So, in order to really prime the mind for this movie, I thought I would give some beautiful quotes from the Course, because Jesus is, is going to help us out here. We really have to realize that, that we need help to escape from this fragmented perception, that, that Jesus told us in the Course, you needed no help at all to make it. You kind of, you made it out of fear, you made it out of terror, you made a uh, you made nightmares out of a horrific feeling of shame and pain and guilt. You, had, you needed no help making it, but you do need help escaping it now. You, you actually do need help. That's why every day, you know, symbolically, we should be down on our knees just saying, please use this day to clear away as many grievances, as many judgments, as many hallucinations as I can every single day. Holy Spirit, come in my mind and vacuum my mind. <laughs> Get the, you'll be the vacuum cleaner, just vacuum it up. And the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, I will do that, but you have to be willing not to protect these thoughts and beliefs. If you start making cases and you start trying to justify the grievances, then the Holy Spirit has to wait. Because the Holy Spirit can't, is not like a sentinel that's coming in to destroy something. The Holy Spirit is like a soft, gentle light that waits for dark thoughts to be released toward the light and then they dissolve in the light. But there, this is not a search and destroy mission. Uh, this is not like the sentinels in the, in the matrix. So let's just say that we're going to delve into the part 
of A Course in Miracles that, that the ego doesn't want you to see. Uh, it's like the, in the Revolver movie, where, wherever you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. Well, we're going into chapters 15 to 24 today because we want to expose the ego. We don't want it hiding and dictating our emotions and, and our actions. Chapter 16, the special love relationship is the ego's chief weapon for keeping you from heaven. It does not appear to be a weapon, but if you consider how you value it and why, you will realize what it must be. Anytime Jesus uses those three words together, it, it should bring your mind to attention. When, e when, when Jesus uses ego's chief weapon, if the ego is, is the belief in death, wouldn't you want to know what the ego's chief weapon is for keeping you believing in death instead of eternal life, experiencing eternal life? So the special love relationship is the ego's chief weapon. He goes on to say, in the next paragraph, the special love relationship is the ego's most boasted gift and one which has the most appeal to those unwilling to relinquish guilt. Ego's most boasted gift. Hmm. If the ego is a death wish, and what we're going to look at is the ego's most boasted gift, I would say we're looking at the key to the kingdom today. Because if you come close to God, but you still are a little frustrated, it's got to be the ego's chief weapon and the ego's most boasted gift is like the guardian, the sentinel that's protecting you from seeing the ego for exactly what it is and giving it back over to the Holy Spirit. So there has to be something that the ego made that's so attractive that you would even deny heaven for this attractive gift. And, you know, We've had lots of opportunities in lots of movies. I, I remember I was, think I was showing a Marilyn Monroe movie, and, and I think didn't, maybe she sang that song, Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Well, we're talking about a gift in the mind, not diamonds. But there must be something in the mind that is so alluring and so sparkling, almost like diamond or gold in the world, but it's in the mind something that's so sneaky and so attractive that you choose it and you don't realize you're denying all of heaven by this one choice. You're just trying to kind of tell yourself, oh, it won't hurt that bad. And then <laughs> you reach for it and it hurts. Not always. Uh, we'll find out. Sometimes it seems to be have the illusion of pleasure, but it has a wicked pain <laughs> that goes with that that little snap of pleasure. The dynamics of the ego are clearest here. For counting on the attraction of this offering, the fantasies that center around it are often quite overt. Here, they are usually judged to be acceptable and even natural. No one considers it bizarre to love and hate together, and even those who believe that hate is sin merely feel guilty, but do not correct it. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting line? They merely feel guilty, but do not correct it. It's almost like the special love relationship is trying to live with guilt. It's almost like trying to placate your mind going, oh, I've got this horrible ontological guilt that I'm never going to be able to get rid of. So well, maybe if I dress it up and have a little spice and dice in there, it won't be so bad. Jesus is like, you've got to correct it. You, you have to correct it. You, you can't avoid it no matter how you dress it up. He talks about in the Course, painting rosy lips on a skeleton. Remember that part in the Course? Wow, that's pretty graphic. Painting lipstick on, on a skeleton. Ooh, that's a strong image. And here we are in Mexico where they actually do <laughs> a 
they paint them up pretty well down here, the skeletons and everything. But, but that's Jesus is just saying, this is not going to work. You will never be content with the day of the dead. You will only be a, a tent, content with atonement and the glory of God's love. <laughs> and so he says, this is the, quote, natural condition of, of the separation. And those who learn that it is not natural at all seem to be the unnatural ones. What does he mean by that? Well, I think he's talking about all the mystics and saints, Jesus and everything. Did Jesus seem to be unnatural in this world? Yeah, he did. You know, sometimes people say, just act normal. Well, Jesus didn't act very normal. And he didn't speak very normally. And his miracles weren't very normal either. But Jesus and the Ramana Maharshis and the Yoganandas and everything, these are not natural in the world. Yogananda, Yogananda would go into samadhi, deep meditation, you know, and his eyes would gloss, get glossy when they were open, and he would go into these deep samadhi experiences, and even his devotees, the monks that came to follow him, got a little spooked, but he would say, just alm into my ear if you get too, too afraid, and I'll come out. Isn't that tender and loving? It's just tender and loving. But everything that we think of in this world as relationships uh, are, are basic. All the romantic aspects, all the, the exchange of gifts and the exchange of compliments and the, all the things that go on to the, the whispered nothings in, into the ear and all those things, those are very unnatural in heaven, even if they seem natural in this world. I was reading an article uh, by uh, Kim Ang, who's married to Eckhart Tolle, and, uh, and it was interesting. She had a few interesting things to say. Uh, Kim Ang said, with the concept of relationship come expectations, memories of past relationships, and further personally and culturally conditioned mental concepts of what a relationship should be like. Then I would try to make reality conform to these concepts, and it never does. And again, I suffer. The fact of the matter is, there are no relationships, period. Uh, that Kim, oh, Holy Spirit's ripping through Kim. The fact of the matter is, there are no relationships. There is only the present moment, and in that moment, there is only relating. How we relate, or rather how, we, how well we love, depends on how empty we are of ideas, concepts, and expectations. There it is. Kim is, is sharing the ages of sages and, and wise masters from all the centuries have said, the same thing. Buddha said the same thing. Empty your mind. What you think, you think. What you think, you know. And after she said all that, she turns to uh, her husband. <laughs> husband. Recently, I asked Eckhart to say a few words on the ego's search for love relationships. Our conversation quickly went deeper to touch upon some of the most profound aspects of the human existence. Here's what he said. What is conventionally called love is an ego strategy to avoid surrender. You are looking to someone to give you that which can only come to you in the state of surrender. The ego uses that person as a substitute to avoid having to surrender. The Spanish language is most honest in this respect. It uses the same verb, te quiero, for I love you and I want you. What is Takira? I always say Te Amo. People. <laughs> I know. Te Amo. I love you with no conditions. So, he, so here they're pointing out that he's pointing out that Takira, I love you, and I want you are used as the same synonymously. To the ego, loving and wanting are the same, whereas true love has no wanting in it. No desire to possess for your partner to change. The ego sh singles someone out and makes them special. 
It uses that person to cover up the constant underlying feeling of discontent, of not enough, of anger and hate, which are closely related. These are facets of an underlying deep-seated feeling in human beings that is inseparable from the egoic state. When the ego singles something out and says, I love this or that, it's an unconscious attempt to cover up or remove the deep-seated feelings that always accompany the ego, the discontent, the unhappiness, the sense of insufficiency that is so familiar. For a little while, the illusion actually seems to work. Then inevitably, at some point, the person you singled out or made special in your eyes falls, fails to function as a cover-up for your pain, hate, discontent, or unhappiness, which all have their origin in that sense of insufficiency and incompleteness. Then out comes the feeling that was covered up, and it gets projected onto the person that had been singled out and made special, who you thought would ultimately save you. Suddenly, love turns to hate. The ego doesn't realize that the hatred is a projection of the universal pain that you feel inside. The ego believes that this person is causing the pain. It doesn't realize that the pain is the universal feeling of not being connected with the deeper level of your being, not being at one with yourself. The object of love is interchangeable, as interchangeable as the object of ego wanting. Some people go through many relationships. They fall in love and out of love many times. They love a person for a while until it doesn't work anymore because no person can permanently cover up that pain. So obviously, uh, Eckhart is echoing what Jesus is teaching us and what this movie by Steven Spielberg is ultimately going to show us in a, a very transcendent way is that what we've been searching for, we will not find. You remember from the Bible, it said, Seek and ye shall find, Jesus said, Knock and the door shall be opened. And the ego's plan of salvation is seek and do not find. Seek in the form for eternal love and not find it. Because love, ultimately we, we've said, God knows not form, and when you seek for love in an object, you are trying to make an object or an object of possession to take the place of an eternal state of being. And it will fail. Let's pull off... Uh, Another one here. Uh, there's a section called The Holy Instant and the Laws of God. And then Jesus said today, he, he subtitled it, Where No Man or Woman Has Ever Gone. That's a nice subtitle. The Holy Instant and the Laws of God, Where No Man or Woman Has Ever Gone. It is impossible to use one relationship at the expense of another and not to suffer guilt. And it is equally impossible to condemn part of a relationship and find peace within it. And here's the, the, the main line, if you remember one line for this movie today. Under the Holy Spirit's teaching, all relationships are seen as total commitments, yet they do not conflict with one another in any way. Perfect faith in each one for its ability to satisfy you completely arises only from perfect faith in yourself. And this you cannot have while guilt remains. And there will be guilt as long as you accept the possibility and cherish it that you can make a brother into what he is not because you would have him so. What does he mean by that last thing about the possibility and cherishing it, that you can make a brother into what he is not. That's just trying to make a brother into flesh instead of the spirit that they are. So to see a brother as a body means that you see yourself that way. And Jesus simply was a beautiful demonstration of simply going beyond the body and beyond the five senses to the actual reality of spirit. So he saw the Christ in everyone and everything. It didn't matter what they seemed to do or, or didn't do. You know, they brought the woman 
uh, who they said, the Pharisees said they, they caught a woman in the act of adultery and then they tried to trap Jesus and say, and what do you have to say of this woman? Knowing that Jesus was, was talking about the Ten Commandments and emphasizing the first two, and he was actually trying to, uh, to bring to life the commandments of the Torah in a living experience, but they thought they would trap him because the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not commit adultery. They caught her in the act. And then Jesus basically said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Because Jesus knew that the Christ doesn't commit adultery. The Christ doesn't even have a body to commit adultery. <laughs> the Christ is pure innocence, pure eternal love. And that's why he, he answered their question with a question, he, let he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Because Jesus knew that Christ was eternal love, Christ would be casting no stone. And then when all the men dropped their stones and they walked away, then the woman herself came to Jesus and said, and Lord, what do you have and what do you say of me? And he said, you know, he said, go your way and, and sin no more. In other words, you are divinely innocent. Now stay in that innocence. Your sins in reality have not happened. Because all sins are in bodies, and the Christ is not a body. So he was simply looking at her and speaking to her from the Christ presence to the Christ presence, knowing we are innocent, we are forever innocent in our Father, because our Father created us as spirit. So that's why he said, before Abraham was, I am. He was totally identified in the spirit, and not identified with the body at all. Is the Christ a man? No. Is the Christ a woman? No. Was the Christ ever a man? Actually, no. Jesus tells us in the Course, when it says in the Bible, the Word was made flesh, he says, strictly speaking, this is impossible. Because he knows, of course, that's what he was teaching, that divine mind and divine light and love never enters the body. The body is like a puppet that the ego made, and the body can be used by the Holy Spirit, like it was with the body of Jesus, to demonstrate the Christ, but, but spirit never enters into matter. There's a, another uh, beautiful being of light called uh, Mary Baker Eddy. You know, she said, there's no mind and matter, there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence, and matter. She was echoing what Jesus is teaching in the Course as well. The Word was made flesh, is just talking about a, a demonstration, but the Word of God is, I am as God created me, Spirit, and that never enters flesh. So everything of this projection is definitely a hallucination. And when Jesus says, forgive me your illusions, he's actually telling you to forgive history. He wants you to actually go into the holy instant and actually forgive history. Forgive the Apostles, forgive Mary Magdala and the Women's Corps, forgive Jesus, the body, forgive the Bible, forgive the New Testament. While you're at it, why don't you forgive the Old Testament too? You see, he's asking us to forgive history and accept ourselves as the Christ, the one Christ, the one Christ we always have been, always will be. This is how deep it goes. He's actually telling us this present moment is literally all there is, and there is nothing else. You have so little faith in yourself because you are unwilling to accept the fact that perfect love is in you, and so you seek without for what you cannot find within. I offer you my perfect faith in you in place of all your doubts, but forget not that my faith must be as perfect in all your brothers as it is in you, or it would be limited gift to you. He's telling us we have to basically stop searching outside. He says, seek not outside yourself. Seek not outside yourself, for it will fail, and you will weep each time an idol falls. 
Heaven cannot be found where it is not, and there can be no peace excepting there. Each idol that you worship when God calls will never answer in his place. There is no answer you can substitute and find the happiness his answer brings. Seek not outside yourself, for all your pain comes simply from a futile search for what you want, insisting where it must be found. What if it is not there? Do you prefer that you be right or happy? Be you glad that you are told where happiness abides and seek no longer elsewhere. You will fail, but it is given you to know the truth and not to seek for it outside yourself. No one who comes here but must still have hope some lingering illusion or some dream that there is something outside himself that will bring happiness and peace to him. If everything is in him, this cannot be so. And therefore, by his coming, he denies the truth about himself and seeks for something more than everything, as if part of it were separated off and found where all the rest is not. This is the purpose he bestows upon the body, that it seek for what he lacks and give him what would make himself complete. And thus he wanders aimlessly about in search of something that he cannot find, believing that he is what he is not. So in the movie today, we will see that that Pete is, as I said, is a firefighter putting out forest fires. And uh, his buddy, Al, is, is also a firefighter. And, uh, and his girlfriend, Dorinda, she also flies planes, but she has this deep love to be with Pete. <laughs> and... Uh, the risk of, of flying into uh, forest fires, flying very low into the flames in gullies and valleys uh, with a plane in order to drop this, uh, this kind of red clay in order to put the fires out is, is very risky and dangerous. And, and this is bringing up the feeling of loss. She doesn't want to lose her partner. And... This is a hallmark of special relationships. The underlying unconscious belief is the fear of loss. Why do people spend so much time people-pleasing except they're afraid to lose the object of their affection? You see? <laughs> you see, the people-pleasing wouldn't even come into play unless there was a fear of loss underneath. And loss can occur in many ways where somebody just says goodbye, or they leave without saying goodbye, or they die, or they just disappear. Uh, it doesn't matter how the form goes, as long as the mind believes in the ego, the ego is the belief in lack, it's the belief in loss, it's the belief in scarcity. And you start to see that interpersonal relationships where you put all this faith onto a body or two bodies or several bodies or whatever, you can see that this is the ego's strategy to keep you from remembering the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, Dorinda is very frightened that she will lose her partner, Pete. And then we're going to see a third character coming in, and, and this is Ted. And and Ted is going to come, we'll see in the movie, to deliver a birthday present uh, as part of his job. Fly, deliver a birthday present to Dorinda for her birthday. And basically, uh, he, he is very drawn also to uh, Dorinda. But we'll see as the movie goes on that this movie is an absolute classic for undoing all the aspects of specialness, um, exclusivity, jealousy, privacy. Uh, we're going to see the main character, Pete, uh, say the words, you know, you know, that's my girl. 
And uh, the spirit will use that focus on, that's my girl, that's my girl, that's my girl, in a way so that when Pete is in a different form, we'll say, <laughs> not an earthly form, uh, he's going to be used in a way where he has to speak what he wants to learn. He has to teach what he wants to learn. He has to actually learn how to give, truly give, because the angel will tell him, nothing that you did just for your personality self, you, can, you don't take that with you. Only what you have given is what stays with you. Because only the thoughts of God can be given and received. When you try to share the ego, it's like trying to share nothing. And, and you actually can't share nothing. That seems to be contradicted in the ego's perception because we seem to see uh, ego alliances all the time. But, but J basically Jesus is saying is no, when you believe in the ego and try to share the ego's thought system, you have a private mind with private people and private worlds. And that is a private hallucination that has nothing to do with forgiveness and nothing to do with reality. It's basically saying that, that whatever you're perceiving in this world is coming from a filter of ego and it's just your own belief in private minds and private thoughts. And everyone in the world acts out that egoic belief. It, it, Jesus even says the ego peoples the world. With, so when, the, when he uses people as kind of a verb, the ego peoples the world, he's basically saying that's what projection is. The characters of the past are just shadowy figures. And yet when you believe they're real human beings, you get upset because it seems like they're attacking you from outside. <laughs> there, there, there is an external attack going on. But, but the body is, is external. It's the, it's the peripheral part of the mind where perception is. Jesus says the body is outside you, but it seems to surround you. And then he says, seek not outside yourself. Don't try to find salvation in bodies you will not find salvation in bodies. That, that is an attempt of the ego to make a solution to the ontological pain of the belief in separation. So the world was made to offer an alternative reality, which isn't really reality. And it's, it's like, it's just an alluring attempt to try to avoid accepting the atonement and realizing you're a perfect creation of God. So there's the setup. Wow. Now you can really sit back and enjoy this movie uh, with, by Steven Spielberg because we're going to see what I just talked about acted out. And I'll pop in from time to time to give a little bit of commentary, but this is a classic. This, this really is, it all speaks for itself. It's very, very obvious. <laughs> okay. So, it looks like he's going down. The wind, he needs a, a change of wind. This little plane flies by and suddenly the wind that he needs under his glider, his dead stick, no propeller or glider, comes in at the last minute. And that's basically what a miracle is. Whenever you feel down, whenever you feel sad or hurt or lonely or you feel devastated or whatever, they all go into prayer, please, 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 please. And basically the prayer of our heart is for a shift in our perception. We need to have the Holy Spirit's wind come up under our mind when we're feeling down. When we feel like we're going down, when we feel like we're dying emotionally, we need that prayer of the heart to lift us. Now, actually, that little plane in this movie is foreshadowing a very deep teaching learning assignment. And that's what happens. When you're praying in your heart for release, the Holy Spirit brings us the signs and the symbols and the characters it's all orchestrated by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, orchestrating time and space in the miracle 
to bring us what we need to look at what we've denied from the light. That's how healing happens, is we, we have to look at what was denied. So in this case, uh, uh, Dorinda's going, oh, you've got that evil Knievel voice, and he's like talking about the kitchen, and, and he, like he likes the fire, he likes the heat, he likes the danger, and it's not until he's on his way back and both propellers go out that uh, he says, ah, oh, I, he talks about the panic, I, I must have, it's almost like he needs a, a look, another look at panic, like he wasn't feeling that panic, but now it's starting to come to him as this plane is going down. And that's, that's a symbol in this movie for our mind. When we think our mind is, is going down, it feels dark. The prayer of our heart is really just, bring to me whatever I need to see that I may release it. And that will bring me a lasting freedom and happiness. So, we're getting a little taste of it here, is even though they have have different perceptions of, of what the relationship should be, and that always is the case with interpersonal relationships. Because private worlds never meet. You, you can seem to share aspects of perception, like a house or a, a bank account or children or family or whatever, but that, but this is a world of projections and fantasies. And what Jesus is showing us is the mind that believes in the projection is afraid of surrendering and opening to God's love. So even in their case, you know, they both kind of share what they're feeling. She's like feeling, you know, I can't go on like this. Um, either you're going to agree to, uh, I'll, uh, she says, she threatens to learn how to fly tankers herself. He says no. She says, oh, I'll make you a deal. I won't fly the tankers. I won't go that route. But, but here's what I need from you because of the fear of loss. It's so high. And then he capitulates and says, oh, let me share you this idea. Try to keep an open mind. And he he joins in the fantasy of the future of Flat Rock. Uh, to, and joining in fantasies can only uh, weaken the fear, but it doesn't eliminate the fear. Because the fear doesn't have anything to do with the future, and the fear doesn't really have anything to do with the past. It's the fear of love. It's the fear of redemption. It's the fear of the light that is the greatest fear of the sleeping mind. And even to try to join in fantasies or illusions may minimize the fear momentarily because there's like a, a momentary agreement. She was basically offering the threat as soon as he said, no, I'm not going for it. You know, and she ch let's, ch let's talk about something else. You know, it was too, the fear of loss is, is so extreme. But the fear of loss is really not what it's about. It's actually the, the, the fear of the light. It's the fear of reality. It's the fear of giving up fantasies for reality, of spirit. So Jesus says in, in chapter 16, the special relationship is a strange and unnatural ego device for joining hell and heaven and making them indistinguishable. And the attempt to find the imagined best of both worlds has merely led to fantasies of both and to the inability to perceive either as it is. The special relationship is the triumph of this confusion. It is a kind of union from which union is excluded and the basis for the attempt at union rests on exclusion. What better example could there be of the ego's maxim, seek but do not find? So when Jesus says in the Course, minds are joined, bodies do not, he means it literally. He means that literally we're, we're one mind. We, we live and have our reality in the mind of God. And the attempt to join bodies or private minds with private thoughts 
is the attempt to make a compromise approach to find happiness, to join heaven and hell. Well, heaven, the kingdom of heaven is within. It's a pure heaven, it's a light of love, abstract love and light. I had three revelatory experiences years ago where the whole world disappeared and everything was nothing but light. And that's, that light is the light of reality. But all attempts to forge a relationship in the external, which is what the physical projected world is, in the projection, is a futile attempt to join heaven and hell. You can't join heaven and hell. In fact, the Bible even says, perfect love cast out fear. But basically, Jesus is saying, if you bring truth and illusion together, one will disappear, the illusion part, and the truth, the light, will remain. So we can see in this in this movie that, that there's, they're acting out all the attempts to try to make it work. I've heard people say too, relationships require a lot of work. You have to work at them and work at them and work at them. That's really describing the ego. If you have to work at, at love, then it's not love. <laughs> it never was. Love is, is of God. Love is simply what is. It doesn't require work. It's the compromises and the attempt to mix fantasies with spirit. That's where the conflict's coming in. It's trying to have the best of both worlds. It's like the ego said, well, you threw away heaven, so you might as well make, a, make the best of it uh, with earth, with your relationships and your bodies and everything on earth. You might as well make the best of linear time because that's, you're, God's not going to let you back the ego says. And basically, as long as that is believed to be true, try to make the best of it. I mean, I think there's even a part in the Bible that says, eat, drink, and be merry, for one day we shall die. That's not very po po positive. Do you find anything positive in that? <laughs> eat, drink, and be merry, so one day, it sounds like avoid, 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 because you're dead anyway. And that's basically what the ego is saying is, make the best of the scraps of guilt of this world because you're, you're excluded from heaven now. And the ego, that's what the ego is. That's what its voice will tell you because it is the belief in separation. It believes the separation has occurred. And now it's saying, look at the world. It projected the world to be a cloaking device, a veil of false images, to keep the belief in separation hidden in the unconscious mind. I always like to remember too, the problems are never interpersonal. It's never really between people. It's perceptual. It's perceiving a fragmented world is what the problem is. It's cracked perception. I, I love the beginning of that uh, workbook lesson 184. The name of the lesson is, the name of God is my inheritance, but, but just the first paragraph is so helpful for us because just the first paragraph of that workbook lesson reminds us that it's a perceptual problem. Jesus says, you live by symbols. You have made up names for everything you see. Each one becomes a separate entity identified by its own name. By this you carve it out of unity. By this you designate its special attributes and set it off from other things by emphasizing space surrounding it. This space you lay between all things to which you give a different name, all happenings in terms of place and time, all bodies which are greeted by a name. So basically what Jesus is telling us is the special love relationship is an attempt to exclude union. Union is God. Union is I and the Father are one. Union is spirit. That's the only union. The, he makes this very clear in his workbook lesson where he basically says, I am one self united with my creator. And he says, you believe there are different kinds of love, but there aren't. There's only one love and that's God's love. 
that love, that, that's why Christ is, is joined in that love because the Father's will and the Son's will, the Christ and, and the Creator and God share the same will. It's for pure love and light and happiness. It's heaven. But this world's an attempt to make another will apart from God. It's trying to do something that's actually impossible. It's trying to make a false identity. It's trying to make false relationships. It's trying to make false achievements, false sense of worthiness. Basically, it's trying to prove that union can be found in the substitute for love. The world is the substitute for love. It's a projection of error. And now the attempt to seek outside in that projection is an attempt to find happiness and joy and love in what was made to cover over love. You know, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like if, you're, if you caught fire and, and your clothes were on fire and your shoes were on fire and your hair was on fire and you had a choice, you could jump in a pond or you could jump into a forest fire. And Jesus is saying, trying to love in form is like trying to jump in. You're on fire and you're jumping into a forest fire to put it out. <laughs> He's just, without using the word stupidity, let's just say that the, the human race is a projection of ignorance and the ignorance is the ego belief in the mind. It's not like the people are ignorant because they're just projections. But the ego belief that peoples the world, that's where the ignorance is. Ignorance is simply means not knowing. If you don't know who you are, then that's the one thing that, that would be the worst thing to be mistaken about. Because if you're a creation of God and now you're claiming ignorance, then that, that's just claiming uh, you're denying God. You're denying God and God's crea creative power and ability. So the, everything that is pursued, that's why it's called the ego's chief weapon. That's why it's called the ego's most boasted gift is because we can see there's a lot of attraction and passion and there seems to be playfulness and fun and, and there's witty banter going back and forth. Although I do notice in their relationship, they do like to launch the, the I call them affectionate insults. She calls him a fathead and he's got a uh, they're pig head. He's pig headed. He calls. Uh, this is typical of relationships on Earth. I think they're trying to be affectionately insulting. But you see the contradiction. What what is so affectionate about an insult? You know, if you're if you're uncovering the belief in the mind, you have to start to realize that even this love hate relationship. You know, she sees him coming in. He almost died coming in with his plane when, when his propellers stopped. And so what does she do? She marches down there and jumps in a plane and goes up and flies wild and crazy to prove the point of how insane uh, his actions were. That's not really the most sane answer to insanity. Oh, I'll show you how insane that is. <laughs> you see, <laughs> That's, that is this is the ego's relationships. Only in projections is there such inconsistency and such uh, absolute insanity, contradictions in terms, contradictions in emotions. There's nothing stable about the projected world. There is nothing stable. In fact, Jesus is even telling us the only way that you can stabilize perception, as he says, a, a, a constant purpose can, is the only thing Thing that can stabilize perception. Meaning forgiveness, meaning the Holy Spirit's purpose for the world is the only stability that will ever be found. And, and isn't this a wonderful thing? Because it's basically saying, don't even try to find stability in the form apart from the Holy Spirit. If you're trying to find stability in a, in a, a projected world that was made by the ego, you're looking for stability in the wrong way. Come back to your mind, join the Holy Spirit in mind and Jesus in mind, and then see the world calmly 
in, in a peaceful perspective that's above the battleground. The key thing is, is the tension became very strong, even though she had like premonitions. When she saw his airplane, she stopped. She had a premonition. You could tell that you could see it on her face when he was talking and the light was coming through onto her eye. You could see it when she came right out and said, your, you know, your time is up. Your time is up. So here she has an intuitive flash, a premonition that Pete's time is up. And he retorted, well, when it's up, it's up. Um, and then they got into a banter like, uh, she says, I don't want to be around when you, uh, when, you, when you die, basically she's saying. And he says, I think you should be. You should be at my funeral. You should be looking good. You know, they're going back and forth now about, about the, his death, but the premonition has come very strongly to her. And, and yet, how quickly glossed over it is. Because he's saying on the phone, oh, it's my day off. No, I, I hung my, my spurs up. I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. And then we see him the very next day. There he is in the plane. He's flying. You see the contradictions. It's the desire to avoid surrendering to the atonement, avoid surrendering to the correction in the mind, and then making up more fantasies. And even when there's an agreement with, where he says, I want to go to Flat Rock and I'll be the commanding officer and you can come there and be my girl. She comes over, kissy, 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 yes. She got what she wanted. He capitulated, he gave her that, and then the next day, there he goes off <laughs> the lane. <laughs> because there is no consistency to be found in the world of projections. You can only have a consistent state of mind when you forgive the world. When you join with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that's the consistency. Consistency of peace of mind, of happiness and joy. But when you look for it in the world, then you're looking for it where it can never, ever, ever be found. So here we go. He's hopped in the plane. She jumped into the plane, said, I love you. You never say the words. He again, he did say the words, but the engine was going so, so strong that he, she couldn't even hear the words. And we can see that's what Jesus is showing us about this world. There is no love in the projection. You, you will, love is constant. And I don't know, have anybody else found anything that's constant inside the dream? <laughs> is there anything that's everlasting? You know, I mean, even the scientists that study the cosmos, they're happy that they do. Einstein was very thrilled to find out that the speed of light, like I'm talking about light inside the dream that, that travels through time and space was, was constant. But, but I'm sure if you go into a black hole, that's not <laughs> true either. You know, that's just from one perspective, you know, because there is nothing constant in a, in a projection of change. Basically, the world's the projection of the ego's plan of salvation, which is if something were different, then I would be happy. If something other than mine, mine would change, I would be happy. That's the ego's plan of salvation. And it's not surprising then that the projected world is one of seeming constant change, where nothing is ever stable. Everything is in movement. Okay, here we go. It's going to get interesting now because we've seen Ted. He was one who tried to deliver the birthday box. He was the one that tried to dance with Dorinda. And now Jesus will use Pete and Ted and Dorinda the three of them, to teach the ultimate lesson is love does not possess, love is not exclusive, love is pure union, and is pure union in love and light that, that God created, and, and that there is no love in the projection. No matter how the mind tries to make it up, it's trying to make a substitute for love be actual love, and that's not going to happen. So this is the the core thing, because as we just read from Jesus, you know, in this world, love is exclusive, love is possessive. Uh, in this world, love involves control. 
It involves expectations. It involves preferences. And Jesus is saying, no, love, unconditional love, involves none of those things. And that you will only experience the love when you let go of the belief in this world. And you will not know love. You will never know the contentment of divine love while you still believe that you can search for it in a place of time and space. Now, what we learn from Jesus in the Course is that death is synonymous with the ego. It's a belief in the mind. And what he's teaching us is that what we have believed to be birth and death in terms of the body, in the world, uh, it's, it's much more like a mind that just is changing the channel on a, on a TV, uh, changing to another channel. The mind that perceives one scenario through its private lens of the ego simply shifts to another lens uh, that's still a private lens and it still gives us another set of scenarios. Is there any life in, in the body? No. Does the body ever really live? No. Does the body ever really die? No. Those are just concepts and beliefs. Basically, death, as, it's, as it seems to be in this world, is a, basically a non-event. You know, that's one of the big questions in spirituality. You know, if you want to watch YouTube and watch all the channels and explore all the near-death experiences, Lisa's uh, the number one fan for NDE experiences. The problem is, though, there, there is no explanation for what happens when you die, because you don't die. You, you, first of all, you were created as an eternal being, and you can hallucinate that you're born and die, but it's basically a non-event. It's like shifting to another channel on your television set. You know, kind of like at the end of Truman Show, after that big thing, remember the Truman Show, the two, two guys that are there, they go, what's on the other channel? As soon, you, it, that's how the movie ends, like, huh, what's on the other channel? That's, that's how much of a non-event death is. Now, when it's perceived through the ego's lens, and if you believe that life is in the body, then it becomes a big deal. This is the great fear of death, but it's the fear of the unknown, but actually the unknown is God, because love and light are all that there is. So the mind has been in a private perceptual hallucination of bodies and, and calling them relationships and calling this actual life. You know, that, that is the perceptual hallucination. That's what the ego has presented as a substitute for eternal life. So, I remember that time, I always tell the story when I was doing the dishes and I was listening to a Ken Wapnick tape and somebody, somebody asked him the question in one of his workshops, you know, what does the Course say about life on other planets? And, and Ken said, well, the Course says there's no life on this planet. And that's, that's the way that you have to start looking at things. That biological life, that what you have perceived to be your life in this world has been a trick, a, a grand illusion of trying to find life in the form and then believing it was so, and then the fear of loss. You know, the fear of loss in terms of persons losing a partner, losing a child, losing a country, uh, that's what Ukraine's going through now, there's a fear of losing a country. Uh, but the thing is, that's loss all just projected. It it's, goes bigger than that. The, the fear for most people is when they go deeper into meditation, they'll go so deep and then they hit a, a wall of fear. And the wall of fear is the fear of the loss of individuality. You see, it has nothing to do with countries or people. It's, it's the fear of the loss of an individual mind. It's the fear of the loss of a private, separate, individual mind. It's a personality fear. And even that's not it, because, because Jesus is saying, what you're afraid of losing doesn't even exist. You're, you're afraid of nothing. You're afraid of merging with the light. 
because you think it's going to cost you something. <laughs> He's like, oh no, it, it costs you something to believe in illusions. It costs you peace of mind. <laughs> it costs you happiness. It costs you joy and glee to believe in these idol images. Even the Bible said, make no idol images before the Lord thy God. The whole cosmos is the idol images. It's not a golden golden totem pole, a golden calf. It's the entire cosmos is, is what's the veil that covers over the face of Christ. So at this point, the thing that, that Dorinda and Pete were talking about a little bit, your time is up, and, and he's like, when it's up, it's up, and you know, I hope you'll be there at the funeral, and you, you know, looking nice, and, and this and this, and, and then you're, he was almost proud. He was kind of like even arrogantly proud, saying, you're never going to find another one like me. You know, you can see the pride of the ego. Like, you're never going to have as much fun with anyone else. You're never going to be with anyone else because you're never going to get over me. And she says, I will, I will. I'll be with someone and he'll be tall. Ted is really tall. <laughs> And now the Holy Spirit, it's like, you know, they say when the, when the dog poops on the rug enough, you have to put the, the dog's nose in the poop. That's what kind of we could say that the Holy Spirit is doing with our mind. He's going to take us into the poop of the unconscious and he's going to, yeah, I've never used those words before. That's very nice. <laughs> he's going to take us into the poop of the unconscious and he's going to say, take a sniff of this and this is what you need to expose and release. The unconscious belief in separation from God, that needs to be exposed. You're not going to have any better aroma in your mind as long as the poop of the unconscious is still down there. And it's not like we have a little pooper scooper. It's a vast pool. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cesspool. What do we have in our septic, septic tank. tank? It's a septic tank. The mind is a septic tank. And there's, people always say, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm like, get down in the septic tank. Let's get down, 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 down in that septic tank. Because as long as we believe in separation from God, how are we going to smell the roses? How are we expecting things to turn out? La, da, 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 da. Happy days, happy days. When there's an unconscious belief in separation. So now Pete seems to, he, he went down to play the hero and save his buddy, and he did. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, no, so you don't ever save the planet, you don't ever save the galaxy, you don't ever save your country, you don't ever save your body. Only the mind is in need of salvation, and only salvation through peace. Only the mind can be salvaged, and it can only be salvaged through peace. What a beautiful sentence from Jesus in the Course. He's just telling us, don't try to save the whales and save the snails. Don't try to save Mother Earth. Go after the septic tank that's under Mother Earth. You want, you're worried about pollution. You're worried about ecology. You're worried about politics. You're worried about the ozone layer. You worried about solar, what do they call them, solar flares coming and taking out the earth? What was that movie, Don't Look Up? No, 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 no. Let's go after the septic tank underneath the cosmos. Do not attempt to change your dial. Do not attempt to change the world. Only change your mind about the world by releasing the septic tank. So in one sense, you might say, we were want to drain the septic tank, but, but Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's much easier. If you just let it come up and you give it to the Holy Spirit, it dissolves into the nothingness that it never was anything. It was just a belief in darkness. In heaven, there are no beliefs. Did you ever think about that? There, only, only with earth and the cosmos is beliefs. And out of all these ego beliefs, the only one that's helpful is, is sponsored by the Holy Spirit is forgiveness, which is just seeing the false as false. It's not getting fooled with the trick that there's an external world that's real. So let's, let's see what happens now because 
most of the times, even in the near-death experiences, they go through phases and stages. You know, Pete's going to go walk through the ashes a little bit, and then finally he's going to find a little patch of green grass and flowers, and Hap will appear, the angel, and she's got some instructions for him. Because the problem wasn't the relationship in form. The problem was that the ego getting mechanism was still active and he still wanted to get something from holding on to his perception of his body and Dorinda's body and the world. And, and basically, whenever you want to get something, you're not in the giving mode. Once you get into giving mode and helping, then true communication can pour through you and you start to let the Holy Spirit share ideas through you and that's even a preliminary step to letting go of the words entirely, like I said at the beginning. It's not like you reach heaven through words. God is not reached through words. God is reached through prayer, the prayer of the heart. And that's why the mystics and saints always go into the silence after they've done their word stuff. Jesus, would, he would go and talk and, and heal the sick, raise the dead, and... and then the Holy Spirit would say, okay, that's just preliminary stuff. Come up to the mountain here and let's go into the silence and commune. You see, that was what the whole thing was really about. It wasn't about the words that he spoke and it wasn't about healing the sick and raising the dead. It was just the communion with Source, which is deep, deep, deep in the mind. It's deep in the prayer. So here we go. Changing the channel now for Pete, but now it's kind of a mixed channel between uh, Dorinda... Ted and uh, Al, and then, and then Pete is kind of going into, eventually he's going into ghost mode. <laughs> he's got to go into ghost mode a little to teach what he would learn. Even Jesus went in, after the resurrection, he came back in appearance mode, ghost mode. Uh, but that was all just for teaching, teaching and learning purposes. It has no purpose in terms of physicality, but it's just for teaching and learning in the mind. So right away, you see how the Holy Spirit, with the pull of a cape, changes the scene. Just as if you were watching a channel, and you hit the, the channel button, and you just clicked to another channel. You see? That's, that's a beautiful teaching right there, that one little action by the angel, you know. Because she's talking about down there, meaning the there's another channel going on there. And then there was the channel with them in the little green patch with the green trees and the, the flowers. And she's cutting his hair and she's telling him, you didn't make it out, you know, you're dead. And, and, that's, and then, whew, then the third channel. When you're, when you're watching a, a cable TV and you start changing the channel, you're aware when you change the channel that everything else is still going on on the other channels, right? It's not like when you change the channel, you don't think that all the other channels have disappeared. <laughs> you just are tuning into a different frequency, a different set of scenarios. And that's because ultimately when you go deep enough, you'll start to realize that time is simultaneous. It's not linear at all, that the ego invented past, present, future, but that all the channels are going on simultaneously. When you change the channel, you're just trying to change nothing. All of the channels are dreams. All of the dreams are actually the same. There's no difference in the channels. Jesus says in the Course, all your time is spent in dreaming. He's teaching us, no matter what you think about scenarios, you have to change the way that you think about everything. To learn this Course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden or, or it will limit your learning. And so basically, even this belief in linear time, it's a hoax. Imagine your mind when you, you have even these glimpses, these mystical experiences where you feel like the name of that movie last year, what was it called? Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. 
When you have an everything, everywhere, all at once quantum experience, you, all you can do is go, ha! Huh. Wow! <laughs> and what did that linear thing mean? No. There is no linear thing. It was never there. You were in this point, this one point, this now point all along, and you never went anywhere, you never did anything. Now, the purpose of changing the channels is simply to give you another opportunity to see the simultaneity and another opportunity to see that cause and effect are together. If God and Christ are together, why would we think the past and future would be different? You know, it's, it's literally all happening at the same time. It's simultaneous. People say, I can't wrap my head around it. You're not meant to wrap your head around it. You have no head. <laughs> you have no head. You're headless. <laughs> so, basically, it's, a, it's an awareness in the mind. Now, here's the main thing. What Pete didn't really seemed to understand when he was in his relationship with Dorinda, he was very much into specialness, ownership, possession, my girl, you know, uh, you're never going to find anyone like me, and, and on and on. Very, very private and possessive, very exclusive. Now, that's just a representation of ego thinking. But, the Holy Spirit wants us to share true ideas, so immediately see with Hap, she's just not only telling him, but she's starting to show him that what he thought was real is not really it. And the only way we can reach the point of this simultaneity is by teaching only love. In other words, that's why you take on a teaching function. Really, you just give your mind over to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and you say, speak through me, teach through me. The, it's a method of conversion for the mind. It doesn't really have anything to do with bodies or teachers and students. You know, some people say, well, I want to be around an avatar, I want to be around an enlightened person and everything, but there aren't any avatars. Those are just symbols and there aren't any enlightened people. I was reading from Kim Ang earlier, and one of the things that Kim Ang gets a lot of times is people say, what is, like, what is it like to live with an enlightened master? And she said, that's just a bunch of exception of uh, expectations and memories and projected memories because there is no life with any uh, enlightened persons because there aren't enlightened persons. They're still projections. They're all projections. And there's not even a difference between them. People say, well, I think there's a difference between Jesus Christ and Ramana Maharshi and Eckhart Tolle than Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and, and Donald Trump. Don't tell me they're the same. Please don't tell me they're the same. I can't handle it. Jesus is saying, yeah, well, a body is a body is a body. A projection is a projection is a projection. And this is a lesson in mind. We're here to forgive the whole world. We're here to forgive the projection. We're not here to divide the projection up into the good projections and the bad projections. Jesus is saying, no, you're not going to see their projections if you keep dividing them into the good ones and the bad ones. Even your days, you know, those are 24 hours of nothing because it's all simultaneous. So there aren't any days. So, so you can't have a good day or a bad day. That's like saying I have a good projection or a bad projection. I have a good timeline or a bad timeline? A good day, a bad day. No, it's the state of mind. It's coming to the present moment. So what Hap is going to now begin to do is, is saying, you had an opportunity with that one channel, and now we're kind of taking you into a, a different version of that channel where you're going to have to give away everything in your heart. You're going to have to be truly helpful. That was the plan before, that is the plan now, that's always the plan. To be truly helpful, to teach only love, to give thoughts of love, kindness, gener generosity, big-heartedness. You know, that it's a state of mind that we're reaching. We're not talking about acts 
random acts of kindness. We're not talking about the projections. We're talking about the beatitudes, the state of mind. And that's where the conversion takes place. That's where the real learning goes on. And we're going to find out that's where the end of specialness comes in because if you give everything in your heart, then you receive everything in your heart. And you give all the love to yourself. And that's what spiritual awakening is. Giving and receiving are the same. They're not separate. One is not better than the other because they're actually the same. But it's your attitudes, your thoughts that is where the giving is and where it always will be. So you can see in this new scenario now, this new channel that Hap has him giving away and helping, you, she, he's, she basically said anything you do for yourself will be a waste of spirit. In other words, anything you do for your personality self is a waste of the spirit in you that wants to shine through you for everything and everyone, for the whole universe. Like it says in the workbook, every decision I make, every thought I have is for myself and the whole universe. Everything you think and say and do, Jesus says in the workbook, teaches the whole universe. So your thoughts are for the whole universe because our mind is one. And everything we think and say and do teaches ourself what we believe we are. If we're thinking about the body, we think we're a body. If we think other people are bodies, we think they're bodies. That's our perception. That's our self-concept, our make-believe self-concept. It's all thought and belief. So you can see that right away, as soon as this new channel of perception seems to appear for uh, for Pete, one thing he starts to do is he, he starts to uh, tell this guy who's sweeping, you know, he's like saying, uh, you, you're, you're, do you know how silly you look? And then the guy looks in the mirror and he, he kind of, his emotions go down. He was happy, then he's not happy. So he's starting to use his thoughts and he's using the thoughts like with Al, he was, he's a prankster. He's a, a daredevil in his mind still, and he says, I'm going to like this so much. Uh, when he sees he's able to get uh, the, basically Ted to, to interact with uh, Al, where Al's face is all black with, with uh, grease. And he's like, oh, I'm going to like this so much. So what we see is that once you begin to... Look, learn the lesson, you have to realize that your thoughts are thinking and you're manifesting, you're, you're reflecting a world based on your thinking. And until you change your mind so completely, you will just have little seeming baby steps that will occur in the, in the change of perception. And, and what's beautiful here is, here they are in Flat Rock, and you can see that Al ended up being the commanding officer and he's just drinking fruit drinks and he's using straws to suck the, the center out of Twinkies. Anybody remember Twinkies? I don't know if everybody's known Twinkies. We grew up with Twinkies and they had a creamy filling inside and Al is taking straws inside and he's got a job now where it's not fighting fires but it's just teaching people to make his flight officers to make better drops, more accurate drops. And you can see that even there, that the, the Pete character, what he's doing is he's, he's been given lots of opportunities to be truly helpful, but he doesn't know how to be truly helpful. And that's what the mind training is for. That's what tuning into the Holy Spirit is all about. How else, with the Holy Spirit's help, are we going to learn how to be truly helpful to every person we meet or even think of? We have to be vigilant in our mind to pray with the Holy Spirit and to, to think of and to interact with people in a way that would be, bring a blessing to the whole universe. So we have to stop thinking in terms of personal selves and we have to start to think universally. Every thought that I have is for the entire universe. When I first got into this, you know, I, I heard from Jesus, freely receive, now you have received, now freely give. 
But I was like, what does that even mean, though? I mean, how do you freely give? And basically, it's let the Holy Spirit inspire your mind and light, you, light your mind up and let everything that comes through you, even through the puppet, come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's use of the puppet, the body. So let's watch here. We, this is a very good comical scene where, once again, uh, Pete in, is tempted to uh, be the prankster. He has a very strong ego prankster in him, and he's now using even his next scenario for the prankster in him to come through with everything. And, uh, and he's, he's loving it, but uh, it's not exactly universal universally loving his, his pranks. The joke's on the mind. So you can see here it, in the restaurant, you can see that, that with, with Ted, he's starting to just profess that he had this deep draw and attraction to someone he met a year ago, which was Dorinda, when he was there delivering her birthday present. And you can see at the end of the whole presentation, uh, when they were both there, left there at the table, basically, he said, you know, Ted, I don't think I've ever seen that technique used before. And at one point he said it earlier, I think you're overdoing it here. But the thing about it is, when you give yourself over to purpose to be truly helpful, you have to start to realize it's not helpful to try to reinforce the past or to make the error real. The only true helpfulness of the Holy Spirit is always to dispel illusions. That's, that is the only purpose that the Holy Spirit uses communication for, to, to, be, to be authentic, to be transparent, but always to, to bring a lightheartedness, to bring the miracle and miracle thinking through and teach what you would learn. So. We can see in that scene that, that, um, that still Pete is caught up in his prankster things, but then at that point he's just, he's baffled because he's saying, I don't think I've ever seen that technique before. He's talking about the technique of starting a relationship, and he doesn't really understand that true giving will be about true helpfulness, which requires a lot of of practice and tuning in and prayer with the Holy Spirit, like the prayer at the beginning of the Course. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for He who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever He wishes, knowing He goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let Him teach me to heal. This is the prayer we need in our mind. This is the prayer that was given to Bill and then insert it into the Course there in, in the beginning of the, the early parts of the text, because this is how you have to have an open mind to be shown how to be truly helpful. Because if it's just regurgitating and replaying the past, that's not helping you escape from the past. And Jesus is coming from the perspective that the past is over and gone. The past is over, it can touch me not. So this is why Jesus did say that, that the Course is really not difficult, but it is extremely different. Why is it so different is the practical application of it is completely different from the way we're, we've been used to thinking and perceiving. How are we going to open up to a new perception, a new interpretation of the world, if we still are just teaching and learning old thoughts? You know, that time when uh, when uh, Hap just lifted his, uh, his, his uh, cover, his bib there, kind of, so to speak, for his haircut, and they went there, the first thing that happened was that plane came, and this, he said, oh, I, I, that was the first plane I lear learned to fly in, and, and this and that, and he went on for like another minute talking about all the joy that he had reminiscing from the past memory. And then she's like, Okay, and then she said, basically, she gave him the, the talk that, that there was someone with you. He said, no, no, I was there alone. That's the ego's perspective, I'm alone. But no, no, there's someone there with you, helping you, guiding you, 
instructing you, you know, basically she's taking him towards this idea of inspiration or this idea of guidance or, or inner help that's there. And that is the most alien thought in this world. You know, there are many, many people, thousands, millions of people that reflect the idea that, that, that you're on your own. It's just yourself dealing with the world. And then this idea of guidance, that there's someone guiding you, is really an insertion of the idea of the Holy Spirit being there. And you have to make your decisions with the Holy Spirit. But this is the first phase that they're, they're going through. And then we just saw uh, Al goes out there to, to California, to Los Angeles. He, he comes in contact when he's flying, coming in for a landing with Dorinda. But you can see she is in deep grief. And with deep grief is deep denial. She looks like she's just turned off. She's just going through the motions. She's just got unspeakable sadness and grief still going on. And Al has had to deal with a lot of that for himself, but he's kind of channeled it into his new job in uh, the, the flats there in uh, Colorado where he's got his, he's commanding and, and working with the, the flyers. But but she's basically just zoned out. She's numbed out. And, and he now sees that he has to somehow join with her and connect with her and invite her back because uh, that's part of him learning how to be truly helpful in that, that scenario of, of extending the, the love and the gift of helpfulness uh, to someone who seems to be despondent and, and completely numbed out and and, you know, even with uh, uh, Dan Aykroyd doing his classic Julia Child's uh, cooking thing and with uh, cutting his, his finger, oops, my gosh, I've done it, and blood squirting out to the typical Saturday Night Live uh, skit, she's not even moved at all. She's just in deep, deep grief. She's totally tuned out, numbed out because of the grief. So you can see that... The Spirit has to come through us to teach what we would learn so that we can allow ourselves to be lifted up in state of mind so we can come into the miracle and come higher and higher in our interpretations of the world. What does that mean? We have to start to see the word world holistically. We have to start to realize that every situation that we seem to perceive is really the same that there are no different situations. There are no better situations and no worse situations. Well, how can that be? Because perception is holistic. We have to see the world from a holistic perception, like in the setting the goal section in the text, where Jesus says you have to hold the purpose out front, and then when you do, you will see everyone and everything is playing their part perfectly. You see how different that is from ego perception, which is just judging what's right, what's wrong, who's good, who's bad, who did a good thing, who did a bad thing. The ego is always trying to pick apart and fragment perception. And what we're being shown is we need to see holistically, we need to see unified perception. That's the only way that we can realize holy relationship, and we can only come to the holy instant through the portal of unified perception. The only helpful perception is unified perception. And that just simply means you do not judge the situation at all. It's not just stopping condemning. It's like you don't judge anything positively or negatively in any situation. You start to realize God didn't give you the ego filter to judge anything. It's the ego that's breaking everything apart. Good, bad, right, wrong, moral, immoral, ethical, unethical, you know, prosperous, unprosperous, you know. It's like beautiful, ugly. Those are subjective perceptions. And, and we were told beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, beauty is in the Holy Spirit's perspective. That's the spiritual eye. That's where the beauty is. is. It's not nothing to do with the body's eyes. 
because the body's eyes and the five senses have never shown us anything accurately. They were made by the ego to be distortions and to be inaccurate, it's down to the very core. So we can't really say these are the beautiful uh, perceptions and the ugly ones because beauty and ugly are, are just judgments. They're just judgments. To the spirit there is no such thing as, as a beautiful form or an ugly form or any of the other dichotomies, dual, dual meanings or multiple meanings that the ego generates. Okay, here we go. We're getting a little closer to the main breakthrough from special relationship to holy relationship. So here we go. This is a big moment. Pete has found that some of his thoughts are reflected in this new, uh, new perception, new channel that he's working with now. But um, he's been he has been using those reflected thoughts uh, for pranks <laughs> and it has not always produced joy. <laughs> it has produced a lot of uh, frustration because of his use of, of his thoughts for pranks. Now he's going to have an experience that there's someone here, this homeless man who's way out in the in the wilderness at this old abandoned, uh, looks like airplane hangar or abandoned building. And he's, he's going to try to use this man as a channel to, to sp speak to his, uh, his, the one he's helping, uh, Ted. But, but what he will say to, to, when he tries to do it, he still doesn't know what's truly helpful, but the Holy Spirit will now intervene because the script is written, because everything is working together for the good, and even in this situation he will have a very humbling experience that whatever he's trying to communicate is being taken over by the Holy Spirit and used for the greater purposes. Why is that important? It shows you can't mess it up. Even if you feel you made mistakes and you said and did things in the past that weren't the most helpful, the spirit always will find a way to use what the ego made to take the mind into spiritual awakening, back to the light. And this is going to be one of the strongest experiences for Pete that that now, even though he sees his thoughts are reflected, there's some other inspiration, there's some other helper, there's some force that's there. He's not calling it the Holy Spirit, but, but it doesn't really matter what name anybody uses. There is this presence of love that is using every seeming situation to bring the mind back into true communication with God. So we can start to realize our mind and our thoughts, the, the, the time thoughts we're thinking, past and future, aren't real. But the Spirit can use those through guidance to take us back to a place where we come back to purity of thought or our real thoughts. That's what Jesus calls them in the workbook. And, and it's all going to be for good. Now, at this point, he, he felt Dorinda when the little plane came and he said, that reminds me of a girl I once knew. And, and Ted was there too, and they're getting closer and closer to bringing, the Spirit bringing in Dorinda. <laughs> because Dorinda is part of the triangle that used to be, uh, really it was more of a duo there, where it was a, a, a special relationship, and now the healing is transcending the special relationship, so that the, the three of them, the characters, will get used to bring the mind to a point where it sees it has to give up that way of perceiving. It cannot hold on to specialness and find love and happiness. It, it can only spring into a higher perception with the Holy Spirit to find the true connection and the true helpful perception of, of the world. And that's what this all is about, is coming to that moment. I think this is one of the most spectacular scenes, again, in cinema history because it's showing 
the presence of the Holy Spirit and showing how the Holy Spirit will take whatever the ego made and whatever intentions that are brought to the situation, it's still going to use it for the higher purposes of forgiveness. <laughs> so, you can see the Holy Spirit's using the cat, using the follow me thing that was a, a vehicle with no driver to take the right over to Dorinda's house that she's renting. You could see that uh, when uh, Ted starts to laugh, he starts honking a bit. It's sounding like a donkey. Who else laughed like that? Pete? Oh, we're starting to see the Holy Spirit using elements of the situation. The cat, oh, he likes you. He doesn't like anyone else. The cat comes. The cat at the very end there was looking and seeing him. You know how cats can sometimes see things that are not in, in the everyday perception. And you can see that this is exactly how the Holy Spirit orchestrates a miracle. The coming together of people, the, the cat, the donkey laugh, and she says, no, I like it. You know, she still has memories of Pete's donkey laugh. And now the donkey laugh is coming through Ted. The Holy Spirit will use different aspects of a, of a situation to start to transfer the training in the end so we learn to love everyone. Remember, under the Holy Spirit's teaching, every relationship is a total commitment. There is no such thing as ranges of commitment. You know, you don't have a different commitment with your, your mailman or a cleaner for the house or a partner or a mother or a father or a child. Under the Holy Spirit's teaching, we just read that earlier, every relationship is a total commitment. What Jesus is doing, I mean, on the surface for the human beings, they're like, what? What is he talking about? What do you mean every relationship is a total commitment? Because through the ego's filter, it doesn't seem that way. But from the present moment, from simultaneous time, every single perception and every single relationship in the perception is a total commitment. Because how are you going to love like God loves? How will you love like Jesus loves if you continue to hold on to fragmented perception? So really, this here, what we're seeing is an example of a, a very good teaching example of how, how the Holy Spirit uses the situation in order to bring the mind higher and higher toward a unified perception, where everybody plays their part perfectly because it's part of a prearranged script. The script is written, but it, the perspective of the script is a lot different when it's linear or when it's, it's in the miracle of the moment. This is the miracle of the mind. Huh. So we love that song, Miracle of the Mind. I am what you think of me. I am what you think of me, God. I am what you think of me, Holy Spirit. I am unified. And the perception I see through your interpretation is unified. Then you are done with the coulda, woulda, shouldas. Then you're done with the hypotheticals. Then you're done with the bemoaning, oh, if, if this hadn't happened in my life, I would be happy now. If that had happened, I, I could be much happier. If the script had been different, then I could be happy. And Jesus is like hogwash with that kind of thinking. That, that thinking, past, future, hypothetical thinking will never ever bring you to the kingdom of heaven, it will never make you happy. You're just rehashing linear time as if it's real and feeling guilty about it. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Oh, if I only missed my, didn't miss my chance, if I could have done this, if it, this and that, you know. That's kind of like Kim Ang's answer, you know, when somebody was saying, what's it like to live with, with an enlightened person? hogwash to that idea. That's not the truth. There are no enlightened persons. I have to, to choose happiness still in the mind, <laughs> no matter who I'm with, who a one body is with or not with, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, 
my watch just asked me to say it again, but I'm actually going to say it again. I will, but I'm going to say it with Jesus here. Okay? Let's, let's look at this. This world is the opposite of heaven, being made to be its opposite, and everything here takes a direction exactly opposite of what is true. In heaven, where the meaning of love is known, love is the same as union. Here, where the illusion of love is accepted as in love's place, love is perceived as separation and exclusion. Think about that. Think about your interpersonal relationships and you will quickly see that the perception of these multiple interpersonal relationships, friends, families, partners, instructors, teachers, people that you've known through your life, people that you hope to meet in your life, doesn't matter, past or future, they're all based on separation and exclusion. And the present moment, as Kim Eng was saying when I read earlier, in that moment there are no relationships. The only real relationship you can ever have is one of alignment and union with the Creator. If you've got God in your mind, you are healed. It's just when you try to let the past and future come in <laughs> that that blocks and covers and veils over the holy instant. Right now, God is, is in mind, and that's the greatest thing. That's the great joy. My watch will definitely want to hear that one again. God is in my mind, you know, because that's the, that's the joy of it all. But we'll go on a little bit here. It is in the special relationship born of the hidden wish for special love from God that the ego's hatred triumphs. For the special relationship is the renunciation of the love of God and attempt, the attempt to secure for the small self the specialness that he denied. In other words, the ego is the belief that God should show some special favor. Come on, God. It's the ego's like, come on, come on, God. Grant me my favor. Grow, grant me my favor, the ego keeps saying to God. What is that favor? The favor is, grant me that I can separate apart and have my own time-space kingdom apart from reality. Just grant reality to my fantasies. And every time someone tries to forge a special relationship on earth, when, whenever the ego tells you, you want to be in relationship with this one or that one or wouldn't it be great to be in a relationship with this one and avoid that one over there? It's substitution, it's comparison, and basically it's a reenactment of the ego's attempt to get special favor from God to grant reality to the dream world. Grant reality to the idols. God, the ego's saying, come on, come on, give in. Grant reality to the fantasies. But God is a God of eternity. God is a God of love. Love is still love. And love cannot have anything to do. It doesn't even know of idols. So it can't grant reality to something that it doesn't even know of. You see, love is so pure that it only knows itself. And this is a wonderful thing. God knows God. Love knows love. The ego says, that's narcissistic. No, it's not. The ego is narcissistic. God is true love, real love, eternal love. And the ego is made up a world. And every time it's trying to make, forge a special relationship between a body or, or bodies, it's reenacting its wish for special favor from God to grant reality to the illusion. There it is, I'll say it again. It is in the special relationship born of the hidden wish for special love from God that the ego's hatred triumphs. For the special relationship is the renunciation of the love of God and the attempt to secure for the small self the specialness that he denied, that God denied. So it's trying to preserve itself by using images. It's like a it's a little tiny mad idea in the mind, 
and, and it's already been handled by the Holy Spirit. But if we believe in that tiny mad idea, then it projects a world and it says, go out there and find what you were denied. Find the love that God denied you. The ego is trying to tell us, get that love back in form. Look, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces, like the country song says. That country song is the ego. The ego's attempt is to find the love in the form. The Holy Spirit is saying, no, you can end that search. Seek not outside yourself. Don't go to try to forge a special relationship and think that you're going to find agape, unconditional love in that interpersonal relationship. It ain't going to happen. It will never happen. That's the greatest realization. That's the freedom. Everybody wants true freedom. The freedom is realizing that there is no special relationship that will ever provide the eternal, unconditional love that God offers. So that's a pretty good question there. What do I want? The temporary or the eternal? The next time the ego tries to lure you to find satisfaction in the temporary, you have to remember that Mick Jagger song, I can't get no satisfaction. I've tried and tried and tried and tried, but I can't, you can't get no, he's singing it right there. He's singing the ego's sad song. I can't get no satisfaction in the form. So here we go. Now that the Holy Spirit has got things orchestrated, now it's going to quickly be something to see is, is can Pete still seem to hold on or, or reflect that idea to hold on to Dorinda, you're my girl. My girl, my girl. And now he's got a teaching assignment of Ted and Ted's attracted to the girl too. This sounds like a movie, except it's two guys and a girl instead of two girls and a guy with Robert Downey Jr. There's two guys here and they're both attracted to the same girl and the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, give it up. Give it up. Give up this attempt for special love because if you keep seeking for special love, you will not find it. It cannot happen. This is the whole problem of the projection when you try to, to use the projection to get something. If you're just going to give the love of God away, soon the projection will not be very interesting to you. In fact, you'll be ready to uh, do your Truman Show. In case I don't see you, ego, good afternoon, good evening, and good night <laughs> to the belief in separation. You'll do, you take your bow, your final bow. Okay, here we go. Beautiful scenes, some of the best for teaching holy relationship. So you can see where now there's more collaboration. He's actually starting to help Ted, uh, actually giving him, he's not trying to, to be the daredevil and to use all these pranks with Ted. He's actually joining with Ted to relax, relax your shoulders. He's actually coming into true function of trying to be truly helpful with Ted, which is what Hap told him to do. You know, you have to give it away. You have to give away the helpfulness. And right now, that's where it starts. It starts somewhere, and then it has to transfer. Now, at this point, Pete is not wanting to be truly helpful in of trying to get Ted and Dorinda together, because his agenda is, that's my girl, you see. I'll help you learn how to fly <laughs> and how to drop the, the load when you're supposed to, but don't go near my girl. And this is how the Holy Spirit has to start somewhere and then transfer the training to everything and everyone. That's where the, the perception has to be transferred. But you have to start with what will work. And the Holy Spirit knows that. And the Holy Spirit knows we'll start here and then we'll slowly transfer the training. That's what the whole workbook of A Course in Miracle is, is really transfer of training. It's practice, practice, practice every day with the lessons. And then as you go through your day, you start to transfer the miracle to more and more and more seemingly separate situations 
until you finally go, oh my gosh, it's all the same situation. The whole world is the situation that this mind training is for. My whole perception of the entire cosmos is what this mind training is for. Not just for a personal benefit, but for a universal benefit. There's a part in the Beyond All Idols section where Jesus says, your will is universal and cannot be content with form of any kind. You want to hear that again? Watch. It's worth it. Your will is universal and cannot be content with form of any kind. And you know, in the same section there, Beyond All Idols, he says this line, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. What does that mean? When, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. The purpose is forgiveness. The purpose is to see the falsity of all the images, the falsity of all the idols. That's what the purpose of the mind training of Jesus and A Course in Miracles is. That's what it means to judge not. The Holy Spirit accepts and the ego compares. The Holy Spirit accepts and the ego judges. The, the Holy Spirit accepts and the ego analyzes. You see, all of those things, judgments, analysis, comparison, they're all part of the ego's defense against the light, against unified perception. So here we go, we're going to start to see little by little opportunities to transfer the training to be truly helpful, not only to Ted in the airplane, but helpful to Dorinda and helpful to Ted in all situations and all circumstances. That's the end of the possession idea. That's the end of the exclusivity idea. So there it is, this is people pleasing. You know, one minute she's depressed and at Pete being gone, but now with Ted, oh. And Jesus says in the Course, don't use your body as bait to catch another fish. This Ted is now being perceived as another fish and she's putting mashed potatoes onto her cheeks. She's putting the aroma as if she baked the chicken. She's putting flour all over the place and she's putting on an act as bait to catch another fish as being someone who's good in the kitchen, who can cook and bake. So you see, the thing about people pleasing is it's all just concepts. It's only tricking one's own mind when you're trying to put on, make an impression, make a good first impression, because there's a linear, uh, basically agenda in mind. In other words, this isn't being done in the moment for the moment. This is to catch another fish. But, but Jesus is trying to tell us that no amount of fish will bring you happiness. In fact, Jesus is saying that not one fish will bring you eternal life. If you believe you, you can catch one fish and, and make a self-concept that will be a better self-concept. Basically, the ego is trying to trade one self-concept it doesn't like, like a single, in this case, a single woman for a couple. And you see they're both self-concepts, but once the mind values one self-concept more than another, it's going to be into loss, it's going to be into fear and doubt, it's going to be lots of people pleasing, you know, because it's not that the ego just wants you to catch the fish, the next thing you have to do is keep the fish. It's hard enough to catch the fish, but you then have to keep the fish. And then when you keep the fish, you have to maintain the fish. People have this with their pets too, you know. Oh, I want a pet, I want a pet, I want a pet. And then pretty soon, I need a pet sitter. I need a house sitter for the pet. I need, uh, it's high maintenance uh, if, if you think the pet will solve the loneliness or the solve the sadness or whatever, and then you, you realize it's high maintenance. But this is what Jesus is saying is, the projection is high maintenance. Let's make no mistake about that. If you give your mind over to the projections of this world, 
it's going to be depressing, it's going to be tiring, it's going to be stressful, it's going to be frustrating, it's going to result in fear. And you may say, well, not complete fear, it's broken into by periods of false pleasantry. So you have basically a world of projection of fear with periods of false pleasantry. Listen, Jesus is saying that you're worth more than this. This is not your will. This is not God's will for you. You're an eternal being that's dreaming a dream, but you believe in the projections and that's where your, your heartbreak comes in. If you were not so believing in those projections, you would see that you're, you're home free. You're, you have a free mind. Your mind's lined up with God. And like that part I read with uh, Eckhart Tolle at the beginning with Kim Eng, he was basically saying, as long as you use human relationships as a cover for the pain and emptiness and sadness and loneliness that you feel in your mind, you are avoiding surrendering to the Holy Spirit. You're, you're avoiding the true, genuine surrender to the Spirit. That's what we're called to do. You can't take it with you. Nothing of perception really goes with you, except you, you continue to change the channel and, and seem to see it in different variations, but it's not going to be satisfying. You know, reincarnation, a lot of people talk about reincarnation in a positive way, but I think we're starting to get the feel from this movie that uh, what Jesus says is reincarnation so, you, you were not born into a body once or many times. You, you are a spirit who has never, ever actually gone into time and space. You are at home in heaven, he says, dreaming of exile. But the way that you end the exile feeling, the feeling of being off the drift and lost in time and space, is basically to follow the Holy Spirit and see a unified perception. Every relationship is a total commitment, without exception. So that means you don't have to try to be around certain ones and avoid certain ones. You just have to stay open-hearted with everything and everyone that you perceive. And then you start to realize, oh, I'm being kind with myself. I'm being open-hearted with myself, regardless of circumstances and seeming different situations that aren't really different at all. Okay, here we go. It's going to get a little more intense for uh, Pete here. There's the pause. There's the transfer. Pete plucks his eyebrows. Pete laughs like a donkey. The Holy Spirit is bringing in elements into the perception to wash away the, the specialness. It, it's the same with music. When you hear music that you like or you see certain places you like, certain people remind you of things. She's going on non-stop about Pete, Pete, Pete. He was unique. She's going on in this and this. And in the middle of her getting back into the past glory of Pete, he starts pulling on the eyebrows. Why are you plucking your eyebrows? You see, the Holy Spirit is always taking every situation to try to transfer the draining and realize that, that it's nothing is special in this world. Nothing is even unique in this world. There is no such thing as unique. It's all projection. It's all equally projection. There aren't any unique human beings or forgettable human beings. There aren't famous, human be famous bodies or infamous bodies. In the end, it's all bringing the mind to transfer the miracle to all perception and see, like Jesus says, make this year different by making it all the same. That's in the Course. And we're in January, ha ha ha, the first month of make this year different by making it all the same. He's saying, let the Holy Spirit transfer the training to everything and everyone. Don't think of people as separate minds with separate thoughts and separate bodies. Start to just let the flow of the Spirit come through you and notice all the synchronicities. Notice here, even when she's on and on and on at the dinner table about Pete, she stops in an instant when he starts plucking his 
eyebrows. And you know why Ted is plucking his eyebrows? Guess who's right there in the same room unconsciously plucking his eyebrows? It's the merge between Pete and Ted. Okay, let's watch it. Exciting, exciting transfers. You see the frustration of seeing interpersonal relationships and believing in them because they're always at these points, and here it was with the music. One song plays and then it switches to another song and the whole feeling shifts. And the frustration is, is thinking you have to pick and choose between people for relationships. That is ridiculous. The Holy Spirit and Jesus do not see such a choice. That's absolutely ridiculous. When you'd say, you know, you're in a relationship or not in a relationship, that's ridiculous. That's, Jesus and the angels are laughing going, oh gosh, still, still, still doesn't, doesn't get it. Because what Jesus is saying is the ego has set up relationships for comparison, control, jealousy, and substitution. You know, that's the, the guilt of substitution. The belief you can substitute one relationship for another is big time guilt. If I went through all the motion pictures in the history of, the, of motion pictures, you know how many motion pictures I could pick out portraying the guilt of substitution for one relationship for another? In fact, have you ever seen any movie that didn't have the substitution of one for another? And Jesus is like, that's bizarre. You are believing in special relationships and you're not knowing the Creator because of it. And again, I come back to that teaching from the Course that I read. Under the Holy Spirit's teaching, every relationship is a total commitment. You don't really hear that that often. Do you, do you see commercials with that on anywhere? You know, it's in the Course, but that's, that's like the opposite. Jesus said this world is the opposite of heaven in every way. And most particularly, we could say, in terms of the perception of relationships. Because what Jesus is teaching is, all that I give is given to myself. He's talking about your mind and your heart. All that you give from your heart and your mind is given to yourself. Everything you bless anyone is blesses you. In fact, he says, only the lo loving thoughts from the past were saved for you, and they're a blessing for you. At other points, he'll basically teach us that, that we really want the holy instant, because in the holy instant, and we let it be exactly as it is, love is totally given and received in the holy instant. That's like heaven. Everything's totally given and received. There, there is no karma in simultaneous time. I mean, karma is, needs the belief in linear time, so the ego sets up this thing of linear time, and even if you believe as you sow, so you, so you reap, if you believe it in a time set, it's still not helpful. Because then you can still believe you're being punished in the future for your past mistakes. Does that sound fun to you? Getting punished in the future for your past mistakes? Jesus is like, come on, you cannot keep believing in these false ideas, even karma, only relates to the present moment. Karma only relates to the present moment. Karma has no meaning in terms of the past or the future, because the past and future are a construct of the ego, and, and the ego, oh, I watched like that one, it's, it's telling me to repeat that. No karma that relates to time and space, past and future, only instant karma. Go back to John Lennon, he did a song, Instant Karma is going to get you, going to knock you off your feet. Better recognize your brother, he said, everyone you meet. Why in the world are we here? You don't have to live in pain and fear. And why on earth are you there when you're everywhere, John Lennon said. You're everywhere. That's what Jesus is teaching in the Course. Your mind is everywhere. Your mind has no limits. But if you try to play this game of believing in the projections and you try to make exclusive and, and possessive relationships 
Exclusivity and possession are both of the ego. Inclusivity and, and accept, full acceptability, that's of the Holy Spirit. So you can see it's a time issue. As long as you play with the toys of time, then you get into, there's all kinds of, of issues that seem to arise, but they're not what they seem to be. So we can see in this particular scene, you know, it's probably, it's so intense for Pete in this scene that he's like saying, Hap, Hap, get me out of here. But, but that's the reason that Hap is showing him this scene. Hap, Hap gave him the opportunity to forgive the specialness and give away the love and be truly helpful. That's what this whole scene is for. And if we say, oh, get me out of here, then we'll just change the channel and we play it out again, seemingly, in another scenario. It's, it's not, the problem is not inside the dream, the problem is, is the, this idea that situations are different. That's Newtonian, that's Newtonian, that's not quantum. Quantum is, it's all, it's all simultaneous. The quantum field is everything is connected simultaneously. That's, that's what simultaneity is all about. And, and that's, the, that's the actual release. Whereas time is, is the big guilt trap. So here we go. Uh, it's, it's almost to a point now where the intensity is very strong in Pete, but it's just, again, it's just an interpretation that's bringing the pain. Not the situation, but the interpretation of the situation that is heartbreaking for Pete. So, remember when Hap gave him the assignment, which was basically to go and, and learn to give, give it away, and it, nothing you do for yourself, everything you do for yourself is a waste of time. And so, that just, that last scene shows you how easy it is to slip off and and forget your assignment, <laughs> even if for assignment. He's, he's there basically to start off by helping Ted, and now he's, and, and it, the whole scene has shifted, you know, on with her lipstick, on with the dress, and reminiscing about the past. You can see how strong the draw is of the ego to tempt the mind back to the past. That's why the first things that I read in here were, were pretty uh, profound. The special love relationship is the ego's chief weapon for keeping you from heaven. It does not appear to be a weapon, but if you consider how you value it and why, you will realize what it must be. The special relationship is the ego's most boasted gift and one which has the most appeal to those unwilling to relinquish guilt. So, in the end, the purpose and the focus is to kind of let the miracles come through in what seem to be very guided assignments, and then to transfer the training to everyone and everything. And that's how Jesus, uh, it's, that's what he has in the, the preface, the foreword of his uh, workbook, that these lessons are meant to be applied to help you change your perception about everyone and everything. And it starts off with seemingly specific assignments, but then it will quickly generalize to everything and everyone. Because that's the only way true perception or the happy dream can come around, is the, is the transfer of training. So, uh, oftentimes, you know, when, when it seems like you, you drift off, uh, again, the Holy Spirit always calls the mind back. And then, drift calls the mind back. Remember the purpose. Come back to the purpose. Ego comes in, here's more past temptations, remember the purpose, come back. Come back to purpose. And that's really what the mind training is, is just allowing yourself to come back. Even if you feel you've made a mistake, and even if you feel you went down the wrong road or you were tempted away, Jesus always says, well, just come back. Like, there's a Rumi quote too, even if you've broken your vow thousands of times, come back. Come back. Come back to the field. Always come back to the field. That's where the, the lesson of forgiveness comes in, the unified field. So, 
here we go. We start to see it play out, but we've seen it do a few flip-flops here, but in the end, it's just using, it's just showing us that don't be tempted to try to shrink your universal will into something into form. If you think you've arrived at something in form that you can be content with, then it's a mistake. Because only the universal will of God and the universal will of Christ can be actually known. Everything else actually has to be forgotten so that the universal will can be remembered. <laughs> that's what's going on from a higher vertical level. And, and that's really what you keep in mind. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what perception the ego is throwing up for you, you can just say, my choice is to be aligned with God. If you don't like how you feel, just say, show me this differently. <laughs> Let me come back into the, the vertical, the alignment with God. Okay, there it is. So we're seeing the lessons are not interpersonal at all, but it's the past thoughts. The past thoughts will just keep coming and coming and coming until you... She basically takes the headset off when Hao is screaming at her and she's hearing that too. But, but in the end, the lesson is in the mind and it's not actually this person or that person, those just seem to be the assignments for the practice for the mind training, but all the lessons are in the mind. So, and the lesson is basically, again, to, to let go and surrender and yield into the, the spirit, because it's not about the people, it's not about saving people, it's not about protecting people. Those are defenses too. Saving people, protecting people. Those are all still self-concept ideas. When you look at those lessons of the, the workbook, you know, nothing I see means anything. That applies to all persons, places, things. He said, let your eyes move around the room and, and look out the window, you know, and apply it to everything. The lesson of forgiveness is in the mind, and it's for the sleeping mind. And it's for it to see the nothingness and the meaninglessness of the perceptual world. That's the lesson. The lesson of forgiveness is it's to look within and find true value. And to, like lesson 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. Uh, or the ones we were just going through recently, the, my meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. You can see the mind training is about tuning in and listening so that you can perceive the world differently. It's not a personal lesson, it's actually a mind lesson. It's about perceiving the world differently. And, and we can see it starts off with Al screaming, Ted's just watching as the plane flies off. We see, uh, now we see Pete's in the cockpit, but he's like saying, this is not my girl, turn the plane around, and so on and so forth. But, but basically, one of her things that she's had to face too was the idea that, that her partner could be killed in, in the service and in duty. And now she's, she's hopped right into it. Because the lesson is never really about, about people and partners. It's always about right-mindedness or wrong-mindedness. Wrong-mindedness is the past. Right-mindedness brings the mind back to that simultaneous present moment where perception is simultaneous. So, yeah, we get to watch how it plays out now, but it's the lesson really comes home strong here about it's like, how do I be truly helpful? Well, you have to surrender to the Holy Spirit if you want to be truly helpful. That's not something you can pull, pull out of past learning. You have to really give it over for that to happen. <laughs> ah, beautiful. Beautiful. Free the mind. Free the mind. <laughs> how beautiful. When I glance down at my iPad here, it, I saw the Holy Spirit communicates only what each one can give to all. That's a good summary of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit communicates only 
what each one can give to all. So you see that the purpose of our awakening is to tune our mind and our thoughts so that everything that comes from us, every thought, every word, every emotion is for the whole universe. Isn't that freeing? What we do is for everyone. Not for some and not others, but for everyone without exception. And that's what I used to love many years ago when I would read the Bible. I would read, I had a version of the, the Bible that Jesus' words were in red letters. And I had that feeling when I was reading the red letters that I thought, this is not a man speaking. This, this is like a, a universal spirit that's speaking for everyone and everything. And that's our calling. That's what it means to be a teacher of God. That's what it means to be a miracle worker. Every single thought is for the whole universe. And that is what the purpose is. The purpose is not about trying to cling to some specific forms or thinking some forms are better than others. You know, comparison's an ego device. And, and no one feels good when they're comparing bodies to bodies or, or persons to persons. That's, that's not it. This, this communication, this return to true communication with the Holy Spirit and Jesus, this is our joy. This is what we've been counting on. This is what we've been praying for. So it's like we can just remember to, to pray without ceasing and always try to remember that we're doing this for everyone. This is not an individual hero uh, job. This is a mind awakening experience for the whole universe because the universe is a reflection of our mind and it's up to us to play our part and, and listen and follow. So, wow, what a way to kick it off. We did. This was our launch into every other week. F free movies, join together, watch the classics, listen to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and as many movies as we need to rinse our mind free of these, this guilt. Uh, there is no guilt that is necessary. <laughs> And pain is optional. We don't want to choose a painful perception of the world. We just want to choose a loving, benevolent, uh, gracious, generous perception of the world. So it's great to see all your faces again. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're all in this together. And uh, until two weeks from now, I say adios. And see you again.